All right, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, logging on. Uh, I've got the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Calger today. So uh, Dr. Calger has a, uh, was the very first advanced heart failure doctor that I ever rotated with as a general fellow. So uh, she gets some of the credit for me being in this career path. Um, and uh, uh, so happy to, happy to host her today. So when I was looking through a lot of recent, uh, you know, literature that's been published, like I typically do to find people who would be great to visit with us. Dr. Calger's name was on so many different manuscripts that have been published recently uh, in relationship to LVAD. So I really didn't know what to ask her to talk about. So um, she's gonna talk to us about all sorts of different things in regard to uh, LVAD and uh, kind of, you know, where she sees the field moving, you know, going forward. Uh, Dr. Calger is from Henry Ford Hospital, uh, which is in Detroit, which is a huge, uh, you know, cardiac program uh, where they do a number of uh, their, their CICU has a number of patients on temporary uh, mechanical circulatory support. Um, they have a, a very large LVAD program and um, they do a number of uh, organ transplants, you know, outside of, the, you know, just the heart, um, but they also do like uh, heart lung, they have a liver transplant program. Um, and a number of things that we don't uh, actually do here at Yale yet. So a very uh, big and busy clinical program. Um, so I'm really happy that she took the time to join us and I'm excited to see what she has to say. So uh, Jen, thanks so much. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Um, certainly um, it is a getting to be a wonderful time of the year. Hopefully all of your COVID numbers are, are improving. Um, and what I was going to go over today is really um, look at where we've come with LVAD support and, and where we need to go, um, knowing that probably a lot of the fellows um, in the room haven't um, had the experience of kind of the older years of VAD support and to kind of like pull everything together of um, how we got to where we are now with the new units allocation and pumps and everything like that. So these are my disclosures. Um, I am um, heavily conflicted with Abbott and Medtronic and all the other pump companies, um, but hopefully we'll um, give you a, a non-biased um, discussion uh, today. So LVAD support, um, has really, really amazingly evolved over the last um, 20 years. So, you know, if we think about the car and the, the first Model T and how far it's taken or how much time it's taken to get to, let's say, the Tesla, right? That That's years and decades of evolution. But, you know, the concept of LVAD technology really has um, most markedly evolved over the last 20 years. Um, and for you in the audience that are kind of the house staff, what is kind of our equivalent of the Model T for continuous flow support is really the HeartMate um, 2 and the HVAD device. Um, and that those are these guys here. Hopefully you guys can see my pointer. Um, and really, you know, the outcomes for these pumps are what really led um, to the, the, the third generation pump of a centrifugal flow support, um, um, hydrodynamic support, which is the HeartMate 3. And this is our pump now. This is the only pump in the United States that we have to implant patients um, short term or long term. But right now, also, it, it's kind of like, you know, the Maserati or the Audi. It's a really, really good pump. Um, and this hasn't been an easy process. It's really been an uphill battle for the MCS field. Um, early on, we've dealt with various complications. Um, one of them um, was an outflow disconnect. If you see, this is a HeartMate 2 here. And this area here, there's this um, device that, that screws on for the outflow. It's supposed to keep the outflow on the pump. And we were having early on patients where these things would become unhooked. And you can imagine that's just not a, a good thing. And the only way to fix that is to go in and actually do another surgical operation. 
And then, you know, what was really kind of starting to be the bane of our existence is we would go through all these heroics of implanting patients and their pumps would clot and they would start to have hemolysis and it could be just acutely sudden or more commonly just slowly progressive waves, you know, of LDH elevations of 3000s and progressively patients were going into worse and worse heart failure. And certainly when you have clot on your rotor, you can see strokes. And the things that we're still dealing with today, outflow graft goo, that's my medical term for it, it's the thickening of the outflow graft, driveline infections. Um, for us now that some of the other complications have really gone away, this is now our huge bane of our existence um, and GI bleeding. So, where are we now in uh, 2022? Well, well, let's look at survival. So our current pump is the HeartMate 3. Um, this was an analysis that I did with Dr. Bacani, who's just down the road um, at U of M. Um, and actually, uh, you know, if we think about life lessons, um, Dr. Bagani has been my mentor since I was a fellow um, at the University of Michigan. And here I am um, years later at the age of 47, and he's still my mentor and we still work together. So that just shows how important um, mentorship is. But this was analysis where um, we got Intermax patients early on and we categorized patients um, according to um, hydrodynamic flow, which is your HVAD and HeartMate 3, which is the blue line here. And saw even if, um, you looked at overall data or what would be more fair to do propensity match data, which is this here based on Intermax profile, age, sex, et cetera. Um, really the HeartMate 3, which again is the blue line, had it superior survival to the HVAD device. Um, and not uh, and unsurprisingly with the HeartMate 3 pump, we're seeing fewer frequencies of strokes or incident stroke is a more appropriate way to say this. Um, interesting trends for um, fewer incident GI bleeds, which I think we're going to know more about over time here. Um, and then when you look at this and you think of, okay, what do these decreased events mean? Decreased adverse events, improved survival. We got to look at the cost of therapy, right? And this was a study um, that um, I, again, worked with Dr. Bagani on called the Clear LVAD study. And what we did was we married Abbott data with Medicare um, uh, fee-for-service data. And um, we were able, because we had Abbott um, data, to know who got a HeartMate 3 and who got a HeartMate 2. And then the other, all the other durable LVADs, which you can imagine the vast majority were um, HVADs. And again, you see the similar improvement in survival of modern technology. And with that improvement in survival, we see lower costs for patients undergoing um, heart mate 3 implant. This is index post um, uh, or index stay, lower cost with the index stay. And then the cost, the Medicare costs of readmission post LVAD, so those are all those readmissions after that um, index discharge are actually lower um, with our HeartMate 3 device that we have out there are only um, available, I guess, devices, I should say, in the U.S. So fast forward to where we are in 2018. And those of you that know me know how much I love VAD technology because I grew up in an era where, you know, VADs were like the cool kid on the block. This is what drove um, our profession forward. So many people, you know, it started out with myself and this gent, Scott Hummel, that were the only two heart failure fellows for like a decade at U of M to all of a sudden, you know, this new ACGME accredited fellowship for heart failure. And a lot of that was based on not, not just transplant, but really the evolution of the VAD field, right? So when 2018 came and the UNOS allocation, um, uh, um, the new UNOS allocation came out, um, we knew that this was really going to rock some of us in our VAD world. But um, the more I've looked at this now, while the world was kind of turned upside down, um, I think we, we also have an opportunity 
to appreciate um, the good the good outcomes that are yet to come and the challenges. And these are the challenges that those of you that are younger, just going out to the field, this is where you're going to have your role, right? This is where you're going to have your impact on advanced heart failure management of patients, device evolution, UNOS allocation. And you're going to take some of the things that I'm going to bring up today and hopefully really fine tune um, this advanced heart failure field that we have. So what did the UNOS change do? Um, the UNOS change did have an impact on device implants. So if you look kind of in the 2013-2017 range, um, we had around 2,000 to 3,000 devices implanted in the U.S., and this did not include the patients that were enrolled into the Momentum 3 trial, because at this point, the device isn't FDA approved, right? And then in 2018, the UNOS allocation hits, and that's kind of in the October. And in 2019, um, we're excited because that's our peak year for VAD implants. It's the highest number of VADs we've ever done in the United States. Albeit knowing that you know we were having a concern that the new allocation system was going to impact VAD implant, and it did. Um, the lowest numbers um, are the the latest numbers, not the lowest. The latest numbers are that the number of VAD implants have gone down in the United States um, since the allocation system, and certainly we know that the devices now the only one are implanted is by one company. Importantly, um, I think the field saw with the changes in the allocation system that getting to a transplant on a VAD was going to be a pretty rough journey, right? It's hard to get transplanted as a VAD patient. So we were already starting to shift over to a largely DT um, the phenotype for VADs, and we basically have expired <laughs> um, a VAD bridge to transplant. So in 2020, only 7% of patients were actually listed at the time of LVAD implant, um, and 78% of them were deemed um, to be definitively destination therapy. Um, so there was a change. So how did we get there? And you know, when I was reading back on this, I was actually surprised at how long it takes for a UNOS allocation revision to occur. So if you go into the literature, there were chirpings about an allocation change like back in 2012. And there was an actually an editorial by Donna Mancini, um, who is you know, certainly one of the, the most prominent um, and kind of iconic advanced heart failure specialists in our field. And in the editorial, she wrote, the current UNOS heart allocation system is in need of modification to better achieve the original mission of UNOS. Approaches to achieve this goal of fair allocation of organs to the sickest patients while preserving the highest benefit after transplant must be considered, meaning give the heart to the sickest patients so long as we're, we're ensuring good survival, right? So this is way back when, this is before we even had any HeartMate 3 outcomes, right? This is based on data prior to, you know, many of you probably entering cardiology fellowship, right? So this was our allocation, and I'm embarrassed to say uh, this is the world I lived in, and I'm so ingrained to the current allocation system, I had to look up all the details of the 1A, 1B, and C but really it's a very diffuse patient population. You have guys that guys and gals that are on their VAD walking around Walmart and they get their 30 day time. Within the same status 1A, you have patients on a total artificial heart, which very few of those do excellently. You have patients on ECMO, you have patients on high dose milrinone, so 0.5 of milrinone, and then you have patients that might be sitting there on two and a half of dibutamine and 0.125 of milrinone, and they're all in this kind of same pot for hearts. And what this led to is concerns about the mortality on the wait list. And then we started to start, I think the field start, started to lose equipoise. You know, we saw these patients having strokes, device clotting. And in fact, um, you know, there was even a trial that was scheduled to be undertaken in the less ill called Revival, and we were going to enroll Intermax 4 
um, that less sick population. And we couldn't even get that trial off the ground because patients were losing equipoise with enrolling less ill patients because of a device thrombosis um, within the HeartMate 2 and HVAD patient populations. And then there were these unique populations, the congenitals and the HCMs that really were waiting way too long with very, very high mortalities. And they said, you know, we've got to revise this. So we look at this and we see, okay, in 2006, all the way over here to the left, there were just a few um, status 1As. And generally you want the sickest people in the smallest numbers. And then as your sickness goes down, your count increases. But over time, what ends up happening is more and more people are listed, the number of 1As started to increase. So our, our net that we cast with the old allocation system was really, really too broad. And while some of these patients in 1A were, you know, floating around on their back swimming, and this could be the equivalent of the discretionary, you know, 30-day VAD, there were other patients that were literally on their last breath and drowning, and we needed to separate out those patients. And we saw some of the hints of this looking at outcomes. Um, this was an analysis of patients that were listed status 1A, and they looked at survival after transplant. And there were certain groups of patients that really did not so hot. Those are going to be your TAH in blue and your ECMOs in orange. And then you started to see the higher risk VADs like the BIVADs or those with device complications that weren't doing great. And if you really focused on this ECMO group, which remember, we're hanging out in those 1As with kind of the VADs that were walking around Walmart, they had really, really high um, hazard ratio. So almost fourfold higher um, hazard of death um, compared to those individuals that weren't bridged with ECMO. So this is what got into, you know, we really need to give the hearts to the sickest individuals um, for the most just utilization. So after we did this, um, you know, I love Shelley Hall says, you know, the patients didn't change, our practices did. And we saw this everywhere and we even see it within our own system. The number of balloon pumps implanted within the United States drastically went up. And temporary support all around, um, temporary VADs, so your impellas, your balloon pumps, and even ECMO, while the actual frequency is not high, you know, it went from 1.5% to 6.5%. And I'm sure there are attendings in your room, in the room that remember that in the VAD era, you know, we would be very nervous transplanting a patient off of ECMO. It was, it was almost a no-go. We would rather VAD that patient and quote, stabilize them, rehab them, discharge them than to transplant a patient on ECMO. So it's really flipped those of us that kind of grew up in the prior generation, our, our thought processes around. What did it do? Was it all bad? No, not really. Actually, if we look at the number of adult heart transplant patients alive at one year, we're seeing overall improved survival. And most of the data looking at the heart allocation system is showing that even though we're taking sicker patients, the actual system itself is working. And you know, survival in the longer term after transplant is increasing. So maybe, you know, this really was a just allocation. So what is not excellent? So what is not excellent is that we had some patients that were on LVAD support as a bridge to transplant, and that's what they consented to VAD for, right? So in 2016, 2017, they consented to VAD with the hope of undergoing transplants. And it's really hard to transplant them. And really, we knew this. And what happens is our practices changed. So there were fewer and fewer VAD patients going into the OR um, for transplant. And again, that impacted, I think, overall survival. So kind of what I wanted to think about here today is reframing all this and ask, well, why? Why did this change? You know, the, the number of heart failure patients in the United States is not decreasing. So this is a slide that, that Abbott often shows, but some of the, I, mean, I looked at the data and I think, you know, a lot of it is legit. It may not be all accurate, but let's just work with some numbers, okay? 
So if we have you know, almost 600,000 patients with heart failure, you remove you know, the extreme elderly, those with active carcinomas, um, um, and you want only the people with an EF less than 25%, you're at 100,000 patients. And then you make sure they're at kind of stage D, right? You want to make sure they're having recurrent admissions. Um, and that, so that gets us to about 60,000 patients. And if you look at various publications, most are going to say somewhere between 30,000 to 60,000. And let's say on the conservative end, about 30,000 might be eligible for LVAD. Our huge gap, sorry, is that, you know, we're doing about 3,000 VADs and about 3,000 transplants a year. So that's 6,000. Even if we said 15,000, there's still a gap in the number of patients with advanced heart failure that could benefit from VAD therapy. So how do we write this world, right? So how do we turn those of us who are kind of glum and sad now um, into happy? And I think really that's just by expanding what we do and what we do better and to try to reignite the enthusiasm overall in our field. So there's been a lot of discussion about VADs and some of the VADs are bad kind of um, rhetoric and certainly VADs are not without their own issue, right? The fact is though, nobody wants a VAD, nor does anybody want a transplant until they actually need it to live. And I think that's the most honest thing for us in our field to say, is that we're not just doing these to do them. We're doing them because we are in a position where people are sick and gonna die. And we feel medically that this is the best way to keep our patients alive. Transplant is important but it's also epidemiologically trivial. DCD is growing. There's lots of exciting things with HCV, hearts, et cetera, but we're not going to get 15,000 transplants a year, right? And our profession, you think about our hospitals, even if we all did 100 transplants a year, the number of, of coordinators and time that it takes to do a transplant, that's a lot of resources for a hospital. And for our profession to keep afloat, we can't bank ourselves on just 100 transplants a year. We need something else to keep our profession alive. So I really think that's where we need to expand DTVAD therapy. And you look at DTVAD therapy as essentially the equivalent of dialysis for those with end-stage renal disease. And at the recent um, couple of conferences that we've had, we really focused in on the biases, the biases to referral or the limitations of, of offering VADs to patients. And I think this is one area going forward that we need to investigate. What is limiting expansion of VAD therapy into our field? Um, for you guys in the field, we have an opportunity going forward to provide our VADs who maybe lost weight, who stopped smoking, who showed compliance, um, who didn't have social support, maybe were from disadvantaged or disprivileged backgrounds, and now they're on a VAD. We want to provide them an escape hatch. So there's opportunities to work with UNOS to improve our allocation system. And those are, those are being undertaken actively. And this is your role as kind of junior faculty to move forward. So the, start here looking at what are uh, the other roles that we globally as a field have. And our role is to help guide industry um, on the science needed going ahead and on the optimal focus of science, right? So what do we need? Do we need fully implantable? Do we need smaller pumps? Do we need smarter pumps? And none of these are easy tasks. You know, the field evolved very, very fast. They got smaller pumps, but this concept of transcutaneous electrical technology, they've been working on this for years and they don't even have it now for pacemakers and ICDs in a reliable manner. And those devices take a lot less energy and require a lot less heat dissipation. So we have to be honest and say that, you know, this is a huge leap forward. So we have to tell the field, what do we need the most? So this is an analysis um, that I did with one of my fellows, Ahmad, um, and I think um, um, 
uh, Beasley might have been there when when Ahmad was um, a fellow, but what we did was we wanted to focus on what prohibits long term success. We weren't trying to risk stratify operative survival. We wanted to say once you were on a live, once you were alive on a VAT at one year, what impacted survival beyond one year, and then especially once you were alive and on a VAT at three years, what things impacted survival beyond the three year window. So we used Intermax to do this. And um, now mind you, most of these patients are going to be the HeartMate 2 uh, HFAT era. So not really the, the HeartMate 3 patients. We had five, almost 6,000 patients that were on LVAD support for one to three years and over 3,000 patients that were on LVAD support for over three years. Um, we, we purposely started in 2012 because there was a, there was an era effect on continuous flow VAD implants. So we wanted kind of the modern era of patients. And what we see is that, you know, in our minds, we know that strokes are horrible and we know that right heart failure is bad. But if you look at this data, survival here is at three years and survival here is at five years. Any kind of VAD AE pretends worse survival. Even these annoying GI bleeds, the more GI bleeds you have, the worse your long-term survival. The more infections you have, the worse your long-term survival. And you can see this nicely just, just by a graph here. The things that were really bad are strokes. One stroke or more than one stroke is horrible impact on outcome and infection as well have a horrible impact on long-term outcomes. So I think that these are our targets, right? We've improved stroke quite a bit, but we, now we got to really start honing down on infections and start honing down on you know, the drivers of, of RV dysfunction. So if you do your multivariable model, which is what you needed, um, we're going to look at the first phase. So those patients, um, who are alive and on device support at one year, what prevents additional survival after a year? And what we did was we took their post-operative liver function, creatinine, albumin, bilirubin, closest to VAD implant. We looked at all their device complications and key comorbidities like age, BMI, race, all that stuff. And the significant predictors, not surprisingly, the older you are, the less likely you are to live longer. Um, obesity um, long-term had an impact on additional survival, survival beyond a year. And the biggest impact was from stroke, device infection, and device complications. And then not surprisingly, if your liver and your um, kidneys did not turn around after VAD, you didn't do as well. If you were on support and alive at three years, right? So excluding all those people that died at one year and two years, what were the big things that, that impacted you? Not surprisingly, age, right? Race, history of prior sternotomy. And we think that this has to do with comorbidity burden, but not entirely sure. Um, again, our AEs, the stroke and the, the pump dysfunction and infection had a big impact. And if your kidneys are not happy and you're not maintaining nourishment um, around that three-year time point, your outcomes are poor. So what do we have to do? We have to address complications. We have to make smarter pumps, fully implantable. I don't know if it's gonna be a reality. Abbott's very excited about this HeartMate Mini, which is a smaller pump, but I'm not sure it'll be a game changer for the field. There are a couple pumps out there, the Core Wave and some others that are really, really early preclinical. And we need to look at our own center. We need to look at our own center's care. So this was an analysis that Emmanuel Kenwar and I did of momentum data. And these were just patients enrolled into a momentum. And we looked at each center. So each of these vertical lines is a center's mortality, median mortality over the course of the Momentum 3 study. And this is essentially operative mortality that first 90 days. The median for the trial was 6.6%. There were some centers that had amazing survival and some centers that really kind of had not good survival, right? So then we looked at it in the long term and we found the same thing. Median survival at two or median mortality at two years, 13%. Some centers had amazing outcomes and some centers had less amazing outcomes. What about the variability in AEs? The key AEs that had the biggest variability 
GI bleeding early on, drive line infections, and right heart failure. What about in the long term? Pretty much similar. GI bleeding and infection had great variability. So I think that this is where our future is, is make smarter pumps, address the biggest issues at hand, which are going to be the bleeding, the infection issues. And but by that, what I mean is we need to have trials to understand best practices for driveline. Do you let your patient shower? Yes or no? What kind of driveline dressings do you do, do you use? Um, and then push the boundaries on bad implants. Um, and that's really focusing on the DT patients. And then of those patients that really underwent DT implant and really got their life together, we have to think about an exit strategy and work with UNOS going forward so that those patients have a viable option for transplants um, in the future. So that's my quick intro um, of kind of the, the various topics and trends for the field going forward. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, really some thought provoking things there. Uh, interested, I mean, some of the technology that you just referenced there at the end, I would love to hear more about that stuff I have not uh, come across yet. But um, first, I'd just open up to the group if anybody has any questions or anything that they'd like to uh, discuss with Dr. Calgary while we have her on the line. Uh, please go ahead and feel free to uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Such a quiet group today. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Carter. Thank you. Hi, I'm one of the uh, LVAB coordinators um, here and was in the CTICU since 1987. I'm aging myself. So I saw all the, these pumps come up and um, and the HeartMate 3 is, you know, by far the best pump, but we are definitely struggling with how to make our patient's quality of life better with the pump that we have, and particularly with the GI bleeds and infections. And so I was wondering in very, very um, summarized ways what you guys have done to um, decrease those complications. There's, we, a few years ago, we changed our driveline dressing protocol, we're looking at doing that again, adding a silver lawn patch to it, um, possibly talking with the surgeons about suturing the driveline down for the immediate postdoc period. We've had patients have holes in a CTICU because they're, you know, they're confused and they get tangled. Um, and also the GI bleeds, we've had a lot of GI bleeds postoperatively and the patients just get home from rehab and we check a CBC and they have to come right back in. So it's really a quality of life issue for those two complications, um, keeping the patients out of the hospital once they have their LVADs. So just wondering if, in brief, like what you guys have instituted, like maybe over the past couple of years to change the. Yeah. So um, a few things, um, you know, we are the ever evolving driveline management as well. Um, I will not even be shy, shy and say um, that I love this, this current drive line that we have with the modular cable. It's very heavy, it's clunky, um, and it can really, I think, add weight to the drive line. Um, we did revise our drive line management. Um, we do the silver lawn, which actually I, I quite like. Um, we were having a lot of skin um, irrita irritation from the like the little chlorhexidine patches. Um, so we we went um, immediately to silver lawn um, unless there's active kind of gross um, discharge then those patients. Um, silver lawn is, is thicker and what happens, it doesn't absorb that goo well. So that's the one area where silver line um, is not great is when they have active infection. Um, we're kind of sticklers about showering, um, which I know sounds crazy, but we really advise our patients not to shower. 
Um, we're okay with kind of if you've got one of those hand things and you're like showering off your back and your legs. But, um, you know, I've, I've worked at a couple centers prior to this um, where, you know, we used to wrap patients and then they could go and just stand under showers. And what we find are those gram negative infections, which even if you have city water or well water, you can't get rid of them. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't happen. We still see them, but um, that's one way that we've kind of risk mitigated um, some of the infections and just said, get, your hand, your, get yourself a hand shower and um, try to avoid actually standing underneath it. Um, we do the stay stitch or stay, the little skin stitch post-op that you guys were talking about um, just to help, especially, you know, the diabetics and the people that are poorly nourished, the stay stitch is helpful. Um, well, I don't have any solid data to say helpful, but I would say um, in my experience, um, I like seeing it there with the caveat is once it starts irritating the skin, as you can get that skin irritation and scabbing um, and patients um, don't love it when that happens. So we, you know, you got to nip it off, um, you know, usually follow up week two. GI bleeds are a pain. Um, we have more and more patients that, so we're in the ARIES trial. Um, we have more and more patients that we are being a whole lot less aggressive with anticoagulation. Um, I am not as much of a believer in just taking everything away as other centers, because I think you are of the generation where we learned our lesson with HeartMate too, where everybody stopped anticoagulation and we saw bad things happen. And I just kind of want to be pure and see the data. But um, I used to vehemently bridge patients on heart, HeartWare and HeartMate too. Um, you know, anytime their INR was less than 1A, we would bring them in for bridging or give them Lovenox. And now, um, you know, we, we don't bridge anymore. Um, and we will drop aspirin um, with minimal hesitation in patients who have had a GI bleeding complications. My usual rule of thumb is you stop them both. And then on discharge, I stop the aspirin for 90 days. And then if they come back in again, um, unless there's something other reason making them have aspirin on board, um, we just keep it off. Um, but you're right, you know, they're, they're not going away. The GI bleedings are, are a pain. Um, we've used a lot of IV iron um, pre-op and post-op in our group to try to keep them out of the hospital, keep the transfusions down. Um, the quality of life discussion is a hard one. Um, I think it's it's more of a societal, societal application of ads because there are a lot of discussions out there about what physicians see as quality of life versus what patients and patients' families see as quality of life. So you know, there was a study, I can't remember who published it at ISHLT or presented it, that, that looked at patients that had had three GI bleed admissions in a year, and they still rated their quality of life good. And they said, I still would have undergone a bad. And for those of us that are rounding, it drives us crazy, right? Because they're there and there is another GI bleed and we, we know them. We even know where their AVMs are before they even hit the floor because they've been there so much. But I think quality of life is often in the in the eye of the beholder, um, and that that in that setting, it's the patient. Um, thanks, Jen. Any other questions um, from anybody in the group? Um, one thing I was thinking about um, and I'd like to get your opinion on is when you um, I like the analogy you made uh, with comparing LVAD therapy to dialysis uh, for patients with that stage renal disease. And, you know, the, the thing that I'm, I look, right, I can imagine is like, as a nephrologist, I can imagine as, as a general practicing nephrologist in the community, um, I can imagine every single one of them uh, probably has that in the back of their mind and keeping that on their radar. When is this patient possibly going to approach that time when they might require um, the initiation of dialysis. And as you know, like um, the vast majority of you know, heart failure patients are seen by general cardiologists, but I don't think there's that, I mean, I know there's not that same mindset, 
So I guess like, what would you think from like a an education standpoint or, you know, how, how, how can we reach the rest of the community to help identify those patients that you showed are not being identified uh, through that graph that you shared with us? Yeah. And I think that's, that's our, our limitation. I think that most centers, you certainly, we want to transplant directly, right? That that's, that's for the good, but there are not everybody can be a transplant candidate, right? So our limitation at, at centers is the number of patients that are referred to us. And, you know, it, it, in Michigan, we've been a little unique in tearing down boundaries. So, you know, we put our heart failure practitioner outside of the Henry Ford Health System into neighboring hospitals, um, you know, with neighboring community hospitals, and we just park them in there. We do our follow up and our tests in their program, get to know their physicians. And, you know, we say, okay, the RVUs for that part of this goes to you guys for the echo for, you know, you guys can do your cardio mems. And then if they move towards VAD and they move towards transplant, then they come downtown to us. Um, and our, host, our state has taken the advanced heart failure hospitals within our state. So U of M, Henry Ford and Spectrum, we actually all work together. We have calls together. We have education systems for general cardiologists. Um, and we try to be as friendly as possible to try to get patients in. Um, a lot of this though, I think relies on the, the big societies, the ACC, the AHA, because right now we are all having this discussion about heart failure and when to refer. And we're really talking to ourselves. We're not talking to the referring docs. So until there is a quality marker and a guideline that says, you know, every patient with two admissions a year should see a heart failure specialist. Now, all of a sudden, the world needs more heart failure specialists. And there's a quality component to it that says, okay, we got to get these patients in. And certainly most of those never need a VAD. They just need a little, you know, um, Jardiance or something. But it's, it's, I think it's elevating the respect of our field and um, tearing down those care silos that I think, um, are existing now in cardiology for many reasons. So we had one question in the chat and I think we'll probably wrap up. So this is coming from Angie, who's one of our APRNs that works with a lot of our LVAD patients. And she's wanting to know about your experience with like triotide for uh, managing AVMs. Yeah, um, we've tried everything. Um, I even took my REMS for, for thalidomide, which I wouldn't recommend using, but um, we do actriotide for the, the, what we call the frequent flyers. Um, you know, it works great. It'll get you out like 90 days, but for many of them, as soon as you stop using it, um, their, their GI bleeds come back. Um, there's a depot formulation that I love because it's easy, but um, we could get it when I was in Indiana. I could not get insurance to cover it here in Michigan. So um, it's nice. Um, it does work. It doesn't work for 100%. I think it stretches out the time to the return for the next GI bleed. Um, I think there's going to be data coming out, though, that we're going to see um, less GI bleeding with the HeartMate 3. Um, I don't have the exact exact relative risk reduction, but um, I think the signal is that it, it's not perfect, but at least the data is, is going in the right direction there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Calger, for uh, taking the time today to visit with us. And uh, really appreciate uh, you know, your talk. And I learned something, so I'm sure everybody else in the group did too. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.